Hi and welcome to Unit 2, Topic 2, Video 3. And in this video we're going to talk about the general solution to a trig equation. Now we've spoken about this briefly in the last video and I believe I may have left an N out of a couple of my equations. I'm not going to go back and reshoot the video now, um, so hopefully you'll forgive me for that. So a trig equation has an infinite number of solutions. You should be aware of this. Um, so for sine x between negative 1 and 1, that's a simple sine x function, there are two solutions per period, and I've got them highlighted here. You can see this trig equation just goes on and on and on, and those two solutions keep on reoccurring. Now in my mind, they come in, in um, two different types. There are two types of solution. One solution is this one here that's on the way back up the peak, and the second solution is on the way back down. And so this solution pairs with that one. That's two pi difference. Two pi difference. 2 pi difference, whereas this solution in light blue pairs with this one. 2 pi difference, 2 pi difference, another one that way, and 2 pi difference backwards that way. So we've got our solution sets. There are always going to be two, unless you're on, on the peak exactly, um, and those two are always going to provide us a series of um, solutions. So what are the 10 solutions to the equation sine x equals a half? And how could we write this generally? is a question that we want to ask. And you might have a bit of an idea about this already. But if we go through the sine x equals a half process, really quickly we get sine inverse of a half, and we get x is equal to pi on 6, which is 30 degrees. Um, sine is also positive in the second quadrant. So pi minus pi on 6 is the other solution which is 5 pi on 6, so we have x is equal to pi on 6, or 5 pi on 6, and then we can get a further 8 solutions just by adding and subtracting groupings of 2 pi onto that. And this is going to lead us towards that idea of doing um, generalised solutions. So let's have a look at the process. Um, here's the process, and here's the example I've built. Step 1, you remember we talked about this process in the last video. Solve the equation for the first solution. So this is what we're doing here. We start with the equation, we do the sine inverse, and we get the first solution. Step two, find the second solution. This is the other important stream. Quadrant one, quadrant two. Pi minus pi on six gives us five pi on six. There's our two solutions. And then step three is a generalized solution. So we talked up here about just adding or subtracting groups of two pi on. To generalize, we could say, well, if n is some integer, then all the solutions are represented by pi on 6 plus, or I should say plus or minus really, shouldn't it? Um, plus or minus 2 pi n. Or 5 pi on 6 plus or minus 2 pi n. That will give us every single possible solution. So that is the generalized solution. Um, and there's an infinite number of n, so there's an infinite number of solutions. So there's something for you to play with. Now, it's important to note here that the textbook we use, and you might not be watching this video from my school, but if um, we use the Cambridge textbook, it talks about a simpler way, which is, is a little bit simpler, but then you need to recall different processes for each different trig ratio, sine, cos, and tan. So I think it's probably simpler to remember one process, even if that process is a bit trickier, or maybe involves a couple more steps and a little bit more logical process, to avoid remembering three processes and then maybe misapplying them. I'll leave that up to you. Read example 14 on page 417. Okay, our last three examples then are going to be determined general solutions to each of the cases given here. So let's start with 2 cos x equals negative 1. As example A. So here's A. 2 cos x equals negative 1. Now I do need to unravel this a little bit first. So I get cos x is equal to negative 1 half. And this gives me x is equal to cos inverse of negative a half. And I'll put that in my calculator. What's going to come out is this answer here. Because cos is positive in the first and fourth, uh, first and fourth quadrants. So it's going to give me the second quadrant answer. The answer that's closest to zero. And the second quadrant answer here will be 2 pi on 3. So that's our first. Remember this is our step one of that three step process. Step two is to find our second solution. And so we draw our cast diagram. And remember we're talking about where is cosine negative because cos, cos x was a negative value. And so we've got our first solution here at 2 pi on 3, 
where this is pi on 3 and this is pi on 3. The other place where cos is negative is in the third quadrant. So this is pi on 3 and we add pi to pi on 3 to get our next solution. So we say or x equals 2 um, equals pi plus pi on 3. So next solution which is 4 pi on 3. Um, now it turns out with cosine that you can just do 2 pi minus your first solution. So step 2 is quite easy with cosine but that doesn't work for sine or tan. With tan you can just add pi to your first solution. That works. With sine you've got to be a little bit more clever. Um, so I would just do a unit circle every time. So there's step one and step two. We've got our two streams of solutions. Step three is to give our general solution. And our general solution is simply x equals 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n or 4 pi over 3 plus or minus 2 pi n. Don't let me forget the minus there because we can go backwards as well. Um, and this is for, for all n that are integers. So there we have our general solutions for question A. Now let's have a look at question B. 10 squared x minus 3 equals 0. So 10 squared x minus 3 equals 0 gives us 10 squared x equals 3, which gives us 10 x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. So what we've got here is two trig equations in one. So we're asking ourselves, when, when is 10 x equal to plus or minus, which means that it can be negative or positive, which means it can exist in all four quadrants. So I solve this separately. Case 1, where 10 x equals root 3, and we get x is equal to pi on 3. Or case 2, where 10 x equals negative root 3, in which case I get x is equal to negative pi on 3 from the calculator. So there's our two solutions. And I can do, our, this is our step 1 here, so I've got 1s in circles all over the shop. Step 2 is to find the second solution. And so if I draw my unit circle over here, I've got my first solution there. This is number 1 in the blue stream. And I've got my first solution here. This is number 1 in the purple stream which is there with the negatives, and I can find my other solution. So 1 matches the positive, which is over here. That's pi on 3. This is pi on 3. And we get a pi on 3 here for the second one as well. They're all the ones that are equal. And so we've got our second solution over here is pi on 3 or 4 pi on 3. And our second solution over here is 2 pi on 3. And... We're dealing with four potential solutions, and of those four potential solutions, we're adding 2 pi n to each of them to get our full set. So therefore we say x could equal, and I'll do this using our nice set notation, pi on 3 plus or minus 2 pi n, or negative pi on 3 plus or minus 2 pi n, or 4 pi on 3, plus or minus 2 pi n, or 2 pi on 3, plus or minus 2 pi n. And if I had given this some forethought, I probably would have put them into numerical order. Now the only other thing with tan is that we could simplify this, this is the correct answer, but we could simplify this by recognising that that's a plus pi, and this is a plus pi. So if you understand this and take some time to think about it, another correct solution would also be just that x is equal to the two original solutions, pi on 3 or negative pi on 3 plus pi n, plus pi n. And I've done it again, forgotten the minus, plus pi n. And we get all our solutions that way because tan is a little bit of a special beast like that. So you could do that as well as an alternate option. They're both equivalent. And of course, make sure that you say for all n that are integers. Okay, so that's part B. And part C is this crazy looking sine guy here. So let's take a copy of that. And place it down below here. Okay, so for part C, again, same process. I'm rearranging. 
I need to be a little bit careful, and this is a method skill, how I solve. So I do that is equal to sine inverse of root 3 on 2. Now, I don't mean to be boring, but this is going, this is positive, so it's in the first quadrant, the calculator, where exact values are going to spit out pi on 3 again, because, you know, why not? We've got some more pi on 3 to deal with. Now, this is our first solution. So we've done step 1. Before we do any rearranging of this internal bit here, we have to recognize that we're currently dealing with a 2 pi unit circle. As soon as I divide by 2 there, I'm not dealing with that 2 pi unit circle anymore. My period changes and the gain changes. So the easiest thing to do is find our second solution using the unit circle before we solve the equation. So we've got pi on 3 here, and sine is also positive in the second quadrant. So that's pi on 3 which means that our second solution is that 2x minus pi on 3 is equal to 2 pi on 3, or pi minus pi on 3. And there are our two solutions. And now we can solve those two solutions separately. So we say step 3, we solve and we give our general solution. So I'm going to do solution A is 2x minus pi on 3, equals pi on 3 and that means that x minus pi on 3 equals pi on 6 and that means that x is equal to pi on 6 plus pi on 3 which is just equal to pi. That's our first solution. Or b is that 2x minus pi on 3 is equal to 2 pi on 3 Divide by 2, we get x minus pi on 3 is equal to pi on 3. Add pi on 3, we get x is equal to 2 pi on 3 again. And then because we're still uh, we're, we're dealing, uh, we're dealing with a new period now, because we divided by 2, so up here we've got solutions that are plus or minus 2 pi n, plus or minus 2 pi n. So when we put our plus or minus 2 pi n, on here, and then we divide by 2, we get plus or minus pi n. And then when we add the pi on 3, that doesn't affect the plus or minus pi n, and we get plus or minus pi n. And over here, for the same reason, we get plus or minus pi n, plus or minus 2 pi n, and then plus or minus pi n there, and we divide by 2. So when we divide by 2, it affects our little um, generalization add-on as well. And then, of course, we say for all n existing in, not the reals, in the z's, in those integers. Um, so there we go. That's our um, full solution, with the exception that I've just realized I've made a little boo-boo. And before I finish this video, I'm going to say that thing there actually equals pi on 2. So if you've been thinking, no, that equals pi on 2, you're correct. It does equal pi on 2, so I apologize for that. Um, but otherwise, that's our final solution. So a generalized solution is no different to methods, except for the recognition, recognition that we could write every solution by adding or subtracting 2 pi n, and sometimes we've got to deal with that in our wash-up at the end of the day. All the best.